Batman Arkham Asylum was the game that finally showed the world how a superhero game should be made, both in its gameplay and in its attention to detail, with lots of easter eggs, references and just well thought out moments from the universe. Now I've already done a video on moments in the Arkham Knight game that you will have missed, and now I'm going to do another one that focuses on Arkham Asylum and Arkham City. Now the game is quite old so you may have seen a few of these, but hopefully there'll be a couple that are new to you. Now after the game has started and we go through processing as Bruce Wayne, there is one inmate who tells you that you're on his list. Now I always thought this was just a throwaway moment of a random thug that was just trying to scare the new billionaire, but it turns out that this was actually Deadshot out of costume, which means that later on in the game you actually get to beat this guy up, you know the guy who is in the way in the queue and slows the game down. I've always found him so annoying because of this. Although in fairness, I don't think he actually knew Batman was Bruce Wayne, he was just trying to be a dick and scare the guy. Now I did say that this was mainly going to be about the first two games. However, in the Arkham Knight game, there is something that I have to tell you, because I've only just found out about it and it's actually insanely useful. Now one of the biggest complaints about this game is the constant tank battles, and one of the most annoying bits of this is the Cobra tanks. Not only are they annoyingly slow to destroy, but there's also no avoiding them, as they have to be beaten in order to advance the main story of the game. But there is something that I'd come across that makes it a lot easier to take them out. You see, I didn't realise this, but once you have the hacking device for hacking tanks, you can then hack the Tobra tanks. Now it does take extra bars to do this, but still, they are incredibly useful, as they take a lot of hits to kill, and they also are really good at distracting the other Cobra tanks making it easier to sneak up behind them and kill them yourself. So when you're doing the Arkham Knight boss fight, they are incredibly useful. And again, some of you already knew that I'm sure, and maybe I'm just being an idiot for not realising it, and that's just something that everyone knew, but I had never known that. I mean, I've been playing these games for nearly 10 years, and I'm still finding out new things about it, and I absolutely love that. Now getting back to Arkham Asylum, there is a room that is meant to be Harley Quinn's old office and is basically just a shrine to the Joker, as it has his pictures and newspaper clippings all over it. Now, how recently Harley has been in here is not really made clear, but I think the idea is that a lot of these pictures on the walls are from before she became the Joker's sidekick, back when she was just his therapist and becoming obsessed with him. Now, we all know that the drop attack in the games is pretty much useless, to be honest. I mean, you only use it if you're about to fight a group anyway, and it's just so you can get there more quickly but there is actually a little trick you can do that makes the attack quite useful. You do the attack as normal, and then when you're falling down, just before you're about to hit them, tap the punch button twice, and the attack will change into a shock attack. And not only does it do more damage to the target, but it also can cause the surrounding members to drop their weapons. Now I'm not sure this will work in all versions of the game across different consoles, but it does work for most, and it does work for mine. I've actually found this little trick very useful. Now, when you fire a gadget, you hold down the left trigger and then you use the right trigger to fire it. However, if you hold down the left trigger and then use the right bumper to fire it, it changes the action angle. And this means that instead of seeing it from Batman's point of view, you follow the path of the gadget. Now, it doesn't change the attack in any way, but it is quite cool to see the angle change, especially since you've been doing this dozens of times watching from the same angle so it does make it a bit more interesting when you're doing a playthrough. And it doesn't work on all the gadgets sadly, but it does work for most of them. And you can also change the angle on the dive attack, so that you can see the attack from the bad guy's perspective instead of Batman's. The basic trick to doing this is to move the right stick around in a couple of circles just before you do it, and then you can see it from his angle. And you can do something similar when you're swinging between the gargoyles in a predator mode, if you hold down the left and right triggers, it changes the angle so that you can see Batman swing around from the other side. Again, this is just for fun to change it up. It doesn't actually change anything, but still it is fun to do. There's also the big head mode. Now, I imagine all of you know about this, but I have to mention it because weirdly, it does actually make the game a lot more fun. And it just makes everyone have bigger hands and bigger heads, which quite frankly, is just fun when you're playing the game. You can also turn it back to normal by doing the same thing again. So this isn't permanent in any way, it's just for fun. Another cool mechanic is actually the electric gadget gun, or the rec gun as most people call it. You see, this gadget is actually a lot more useful than the game lets you know. Now you can use it on the detective mode blockers in predator mode. 
so that they are not able to see you. It only is a temporary thing, as it only shorts it out for a little while and then it comes back. But still, it lets you use detective mode for a little while without having to attack. And if you haven't upgraded to the point where you can actually take out their ability to use detective mode, it is incredibly useful. And it also works on the cars that are littered around Gotham. You shoot them and the lights go on and off. It's not in any way useful for anything, but it is kind of fun. And it really does show an attention for detail. You can also use this electric ball on turrets, so they fire and attack the bad guys. And you can use it from any distance. It's actually the only gadget that fires for infinity. So you can kind of use it like a sniper rifle from a distance to attack different characters, which can be really useful in the game, especially if you don't want to be seen during a predator mode. Now, Killer Croc is actually one of the few supervillains to appear in all four of the Arkham games, but his role in Arkham City is very small and quite hard to find. There is a place in the sewers where you solve one of the Riddler's riddles and then Croc suddenly jumps out of the sewer water in a terrifying jump scare, although weirdly he ends up not attacking. Your scent is different. I smell death on you. I don't need to fight you, Batman. I just need to wait, and then I will feed on your corpse. So he just leaves, and he doesn't appear in the game again. Though it is actually referenced in the Arkham Knight game by the scientist of Iron Heights that when they captured him, they did find him living in the sewers. He'd made his own little den. So this is just a nice little linking of him being there. He also makes an Easter egg cameo in the Iceberg Lounge challenge map. He's just chilling in the back of the level, smoking a cigar and drinking some brandy. He is at the club after all. And they actually have a callback to this in the Arkham Knight game. If you play the same level in that game and get to 1 million points, then Killer Croc will jump out of the audience where he was sitting and attack you and Nightwing. It's basically just the same fight you have in the extra DLC in the main game, but still it's kind of cool that they have this there. Now there's one secret in this game that basically everyone knows about at this point, and that is Azrael. You see, he is hiding in Arkham City in random places. Just after cutscenes, you can jump up to him, and then he stabs the ground and leaves a little graffiti, and you add all of his bits together, because he leaves several, and it forms a map, and shows Batman where he is. And then you're able to go there, and he and Batman have a conversation. He hints about a disaster coming that is foreshadowing the events of Arkham Knight, and then he basically disappears. It's kind of pointless, really. But there are two extra things about this that you may not know. The first is that his first appearance is not where most of us thought it was. You see, the first time you can actually go up to him and get the first clue is after the Two-Face level. However, he actually is there at the very, very beginning when Bruce Wayne is walking through the prison. He's up on the rooftops watching, and it is very, very easy to miss, as I did on many playthroughs, but he is actually up there and he's completely impossible to interact with, but still, it's kind of cool that he is there at the beginning. And if you're actually far enough away from him, and you throw a remote control batarang at him, then he'll just casually catch it. And I love this little feature, because it not only shows his skill, but the fact that he just stands there saying, yeah, I'm here, and I'm not leaving, so come over, I've got something to show you, come on. It's just kind of cool, to be honest. I don't know why, but I just really like the idea of this. Usually in games when they have things like this, where you have to jump up to activate a game trigger, they don't really do anything, they're just static. So I kind of like the fact that he will catch them. I just think it's fun. Now, in Arkham Knight, Batman doesn't tell Tim Drake that Barbara Gordon has been kidnapped, and then he doesn't tell her that she's dead. This is just a normal part of the main cutscenes of the game. However, after Robin tries to lock you up, once he's learned that you're going to turn into the Joker, and then you instead betray him and throw him in the prison cell instead, and then you leave to go get on with the game, well, if instead of going up the lift and getting on with the game, you can turn back and you can actually talk to Robin and tell him that Barbara Gordon is dead. And Robin just loses it in his cell, which is completely understandable. I won't let them get you as well. Bruce, please. I have to do this. No. You son of a bitch! How dare you! You don't get to decide! Get away from me! Go! And this is actually a terrible move on Batman's part, because as we all know, it turns out she's still alive. And basically, he locks up Robin and puts him through an insane amount of grief for no reason. 
And ironically, this was Batman trying to do the right thing. Whereas if he just carried on lying to him, he never would have felt any pain for this and it would have been fine. Although saying it was the right thing's kind of a lie as he was just telling him to make himself feel better, not to make Robin feel better. And quite frankly, even if she was actually dead, this is still a horrible thing to do. I mean, he's already locked up in the cell. You can save this moment for later when he's got someone around him where he can grieve and try and make himself feel less sad. But instead, you do it when he's locked in a prison cell? I mean, that's just cruel. Now in Arkham City, there is a fake game over moment. You see, in the final level of Catwoman, when she discovers that Batman is trapped in a building, and then she has the choice to take the loot or leave it and go help Batman. And of course she leaves it and goes help Batman because that's how the game goes. Since when did you grow a conscience? Don't die, Batman. I'm coming to save you. Well, Catwoman has this choice where she can actually go. Now, if you're anything like me, you might have said, yes, I'll leave him once, but then on the next prompt said, no, I better go because obviously I need to. It's just going to keep prompting me to go back. Well, it doesn't actually keep prompting you to go back. Instead, the end credits will roll and the game will end with a final message from Oracle that Batman is dead and asking for someone to help them. Joker's one. I can't believe I'm saying this. He's one. There's nothing we can do. Bruce is dead. He's gone. They're all gone. If you can hear this, send help, please. And it literally plays through all the credits. It takes ages. And the first time I actually did this, when I decided to test out whether I could leave, I turned off the console, rebooted it and just started again. However, I later found out that if you let it play all the way to the end, it will actually stop and then rewind and let Catwoman make the choice again. And you can either keep doing a loop where it keeps going back through the credits forward and backwards, or you can say, I'll leave the loot and go help Batman. So basically you have no choice, but I really do like that you have the option. Now, in Arkham Asylum, in Warden Sharp's office, there is a secret room. A room that you can only access by setting off several explosive gel attacks in specific places. Now, most people have heard of this at this point, but still I've got to mention it because it was actually one of the best Easter eggs that Rocksteady have done. In fact, it was so good that no one was able to find it for a year, until eventually they had to release more details so people could find it, or it was basically never going to be found. Now, once you go in that room, you can see that the Quincy has plans for Arkham City. These are plans which he then uses as part of his campaign platform for when he's becoming elected as mayor. And it's interesting to know that the game developers did have this sequel in mind from the very beginning, as this clearly shows. And there are two other secret areas relating to the sequel games. In Arkham Asylum, there is a secret area in the vents that shows the plans that Scarecrow had. It's a hidden little area that he's clearly been going to while he's a prisoner in order to make future plans. And there is a similar one, although it's much bigger and much nicer, in Arkham City. There is a boat in the water that if you land on and enter a secret code, the hatch opens and you can go down and see Scarecrow's hidden planning area. It doesn't have a great deal in there, but it shows Scarecrow's plans for what becomes the Arkham Knight game. And it also has a man who Scarecrow has been testing his new fear toxins on. And by testing, I mean he exposed humans to it and probably sent them mental. And it is really nice here to see that the Arkham Knight game was also planned. I mean, Rocksteady obviously wouldn't have had everything about these games planned out from the beginning. That's just not how it works. But they clearly did have some idea of where they were going to take the story. It was very well thought out on the whole. And in the Arkham Origins game, you can actually play as both Bane and the Joker. Now, we all know about the Joker level in the game, of course. But there was actually an online mode that let you play as both Joker and Bane. And the basic premise of it was that they were both trying to raise an army and Batman and Robin were trying to stop them. And you could play as any one of these four characters. Now, sadly, this online mode is no longer playable as the online option was taken off of the servers. But fortunately, some very smart people have figured out how to mod it so it can still be played in 2023 or 2024. Now, I will leave links and instructions in the description of this video for anyone who wants to give it a go. But I do have to say that it only works on Steam and on PC. It doesn't work on console. And of course, I can't guarantee that it will continue to work in the future. Now, in the Arkham Knight Batgirl DLC mission, there is a message that can be played of Edward Burke, talking about his park and his dead child. And if you listen to all of these, it is actually revealed that both Harley and the Joker are conning him. 
You see, he knows Joker as Jack and Harley as Dr. Quinzel, and they talk him into sending his sick daughter to see Dr. Young. That was the doctor that Joker was blackmailing in the Arkham Asylum game. And presumably, this kid is getting some kind of Titan formula therapy to make him better. But then, Joker cuts this child off from the medication, and he dies. And Harley, or rather Dr. Quinzel, convinces him that the pain from losing his daughter will never go away, and that he should just take his own life. I signed the park over to Jack, and uh, well, my only hope is that he does something inspiring with it. As for me, I'll, I'll be with Katie soon. So basically, Harley and the Joker kill this man's child and then talk him into killing himself. That is messed up. And of course, there is one other great Easter egg in this level. If you go into one room, you can see that Starro is trapped inside of a container. Starro is, of course, the spore that latches onto your face and takes control of your body. In fact, there's actually a sign of one man being controlled by a Starro spore. And since this is now the Joker's Park, it is quite possible that he would actually kill someone in this way just for the Starro attraction. But no one knows for sure, as it's never actually mentioned again. It's just a throwaway little Easter egg. And also, it's probably not the proper Starro, because if it was, it would latch onto someone and try to take over the planet. Now, in the Arkham Knight game, there is a Wayne Manor challenge map. And if you actually play with the piano, then a section of the wall will move back to reveal a whiteboard full of case files. These are Batman's case files, of course, and specifically, they are notes for what is actually the Arkham VR game. In that game, he's trying to track some stuff down and figure it out, and these are the whiteboard notes that he made about that case. This has actually got no bearing on anything, really, but it is quite cool that it's in there. Now, as we all know, the Arkham games are set to be done just in one night, and that's why Batman's cape and his uniform get progressively more tattered and ripped throughout the game. But one thing you might not have noticed is that Batman also grows a noticeable amount of stubble on his face. Now, I think that is just an amazing touch of detail, and honestly, before I was researching for this video, I had never noticed it. But now when I play, I do actually look at his face, and you can see at the end that he has grown a bit of stubble. And I just love this attention to detail. It really shows how well thought out this game was. Now, periodically throughout the Asylum game, if you visit the visiting center, then Joker will monologue to you from a TV on a mannequin. Although if you turn around and then look back at the mannequin, the mannequin will have actually moved. And this is a very subtle reference to the fact that the mannequin is actually the Joker and other humans in the other mannequins just wearing a suit. And thanks to PC mods, you can actually use detective vision to see that they do have a human skeleton and heartbeat. And if only Batman had realized this in the game, he could have ended the whole thing a lot quicker. Now, the first game was actually supposed to have rain, hence the lightning strikes and the fact that the guards are wearing raincoats. But the gaming consoles of the time weren't able to handle this. But when the game was remastered and re-released, they did add the rain as they originally intended. So finally, the guards wearing those raincoats makes sense. I always just thought it was part of their uniform. I didn't realize that there was actually intention behind it. Now, Rocksteady did actually hold a contest where the winner would appear in one of the games, and it was won by Luke Oliver, and so there is an inmate in the game made to look like him. And personally, I think he is terrifying in appearance because he doesn't conform to the game's face designs like the other characters do, but hey, he was still immortalized, so good for him. He's also one of the guests on Joker's list of villains who are allowed to his party, and I think that is just a nice little touch. Now, in the part of the game where you find Joker in the elevator, you can actually see several crates of Titan formula that are being sent as presents from the Joker, and they're addressed to several different villains. Though, in the remastered version, the names are all changed to the Penguin. Now, this is most likely due to the fact that in the Arkham City game, they gave him Titan fighters, and so they're changing it all to him to try and explain where he got the formula from. And in one of the many automated PA system recordings, they mentioned the website Arkham Care. Now, at the time of the game's release, if you actually went to this website, it would give you information about Arkham Asylum and the treatments they offer. Of course, the game was released back in 2009, so the site has since been taken down because it didn't really get that much traffic. I mean, it never even occurred to me to check it, so I imagine a lot of other people haven't even heard of it. And of course, it costs money to keep this up, so they were never gonna keep it up forever. But still, that is kinda cool. Now, these games are packed with Easter eggs, references, and secrets, 
So there is no way that I have listed them all. So please, if you know of any others that I haven't mentioned, then let us know about them in the comments. Along with which one of these is your personal favorite, of course. And I'd just like to quickly remind everyone that we have some merchandise available on our store and to say thanks to all of you who have donated to the Needle Mouse Productions page on Patreon. And as always, thanks for watching and feel free to subscribe, share, like and comment.